Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. From the Royal York Hotel in downtown Toronto, welcome to the Empire Club of Canada. For those of you just joining us through either our webcast or our podcast, welcome to the meeting. Before our distinguished speakers are introduced today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our head table guests. I would ask each guest to rise for a brief moment and be seated as your name is called, and I would ask the audience to please refrain from applauding until the head table guests have all been introduced. From the audience's far left, Mr. William White, Chairman, IBK Capital Corporation and a director of the Empire Club of Canada, and I, if I can say so, one of our most valuable members. What would we do without him? <laughs> Veronica Knott, fourth year UBC mining engineering and mineral processing student and 2017 gold medal student award winner, Barrick Gold Corporation intern at Hemlo Mine Site. Congratulations. Georgina Blanis, Executive Director, PCMA, and a Director of the Empire Club of Canada. Alex Graham, Managing Director, Global Investment, Banking, and Head Communications, Media and Technology, RBC Capital Markets. Thomas Micah, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Port Technologies Incorporated. Dr. Jay Smith, Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager, CIBC Wood Gundy. Lance Hooper, President and Chief Operating Officer, Cobalt Blockchain, SARL. Thomas Caldwell, Chairman, Caldwell Financial Limited and President, Urbana Corporation. Vern Brownell, its Chief Executive Officer, Deep Wave Systems, Inc. Mike White, President and CEO, IBK Capital. Dr. James Olson, Dean, Faculty of Applied Science, the University of British Columbia. And from your far right, Dr. Gordon McIver, past president, the Empire Club of Canada. Debbie Wu, senior director, faculty of applied science, UBC. Vivian Club, head of communications and marketing, IBK Capital Corporation. Philip Grosh, president, Treble Victor Group. Lisa Cheng, founder and head of R&D, Van Bex Group. Ian Russell, president and CEO, IA. IIAC. Randall Oliphant, Director, New Gold, Inc. Don Listwin, Director of D-Wave Systems, Inc., Port Technologies, and Teradix. Suganya Tarmalingan, Managing Director and Investment Committee Member, Chief Financial Officer, Kensington Capital Partners Limited. Dr. Suresh Venkatesan, Chief Executive Officer, Port Technologies, Inc. Dr. Rob McEwen, welcome back. Chief Owner and Chairman of McEwen Mining Inc., Founder of Gold Corp., and Founder of the McEwen Center for Regenerative Medicine. And my name is Barbara Jess, and I'm the President of Jess and Company Communications and the President of the Empire Club of Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, your head table. <laughs> We're also very pleased to welcome a group of students from the University of British Columbia and Ryerson University and Centennial College. Students, please rise and be, be recognized. We're so pleased to have you with us. Many people make New Year's resolutions to lose weight, exercise more, or learn a second language. My commitment this year was to learn, finally, something, at least generally, about quantum physics and quantum computing. No laughing, please. I'm nothing if not determined, and I, have, and I have been reading, but so far, I haven't been doing too well. So I was particularly delighted to learn that I will be hosting this lunch today, not to put too much pressure on our guests, but I'm really counting on you for an aha moment. You may be asking what brought me to this rather ambitious undertaking. It probably started with a feature article I read about a year ago in The Economist. The editorial suggested that after years of theoretical discussion, mind-bending quantum effects are about to power mainstream innovation. They talked about a bathing cap that can watch individual neurons allowing others to monitor the wearer's mind, a sensor that can spot hidden nuclear submarines, computers that can discover new drugs, revolutionize securities trading, and design new materials 
a global network of communications links whose security is underwritten by unbreakable physical laws. All of this is apparently the promise of quantum technology and it's just around the corner. <clears throat> I suspect that if you're in the room today, you're more informed than I am. But for the lay reader, at least, until recently, quantum physics has been weirdly confusing. We've been asked to give up our ideas of time and embrace a universe based on probabilities rather than certainties. Again, I'm possibly the only one here today struggling to understand how the act of measuring something changes the measurement. Or comprehend that particles are neither here nor there, but until pinned down in both places at once. I'm noodling around notions of entanglement and qubits. Not that I expect I'm ever going to have to be an expert on any of this. Good luck with that. But I do think that a basic grasp of the theory is going to be critical to living and working in the 21st century. The article in The Economist that fostered this curiosity for me also talked about a Canadian company called D-Wave began, that began selling the first commercially available quantum computer in 2011. With us today is Vern Brownell, who joined D-Wave as CEO in 2009, leading the company through its transition from research into the leader in the development and delivery of quantum computing systems and software. During his tenure, D-Wave secured its first customers, including Lockheed Martin, a former client of mine, Google, NASA, and Los Alamos National Laboratory, and raised over $170 million in venture funding. Mr. Brownell joined D-Wave from Egenera, a pioneer of infrastructure virtualization, the company he founded after serving as the chief technology officer at Goldman Sachs. Joining him is Dr. James Olson, Dean of the Faculty of Applied Science and a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of British Columbia. Dean Olson spearheaded a number of initiatives aiming at, aimed at transforming engineering education in the 21st century, including efforts to enrich diversity, student work experience, and business leadership and entrepreneurship programs. A fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering and the recipient of multiple research awards, Dean Olson also served as inter interim director of the Institute for Computing Information and Cognitive UBC. Gentlemen, we're delighted to welcome you to our podium. I'm counting on you for enlightenment. And first to, to come forward will be Vern Brunel. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks to the Empire Club and the organizing committee. It's a pleasure to be here. I have 12 minutes to describe quantum mechanics, quantum physics to you, so I'm going to go really fast and dive in. So something really interesting happened, happened at the beginning of the 20th century. Physicists and scientists recognized that the, the theories that they had regarding how the universe worked were completely wrong. They, they had thought that everything worked on a very deliberate, so-called classical set of mechanics. And actually, what, what, what great scientists like uh, Schrodinger and uh, Max Planck this, found is that the world really operates on something called quantum physics. And it really is the set of laws that govern the universe at this point uh, for, and forever. Um, so, so uh, first, Max Planck, German scientist, discovered this uh, back in the, the late 20th century. Then the, the next step was uh, um, Erwin Schrodinger developed a really rich set of equations to describe how quantum mechanics worked. Uh, and then Einstein, who was actually a little bit skeptical in the beginning, signed on and became a real contributor to the field of uh, quantum mechanics. Then if we fast forward to 1981, a gentleman named Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winner in, from the States, conjectured that if you could build a computer that could use directly the, the properties of quantum mechanics, that it would provide you with unprecedented performance and be able to solve problems that you couldn't with a plain old computer that used classical physics. So it was really this intuition, it was at a, a talk that he gave in 1981, that started the race to build uh, the theory and the implementation around quantum computing. So if we fast forward 37 years, here we are, quantum computing is in the news. It's all over the place. You've probably seen a lot of it. Uh, we've got Morgan Stanley, you know, the, the, the big investment bank, covering it as one of the most important technology innovations. It's on the front page of The Economist. 
Google, NASA, Google, Lockheed Martin, sorry, Google, IBM, uh, Intel, all have robust quantum computing efforts. And this news is, is blossoming all over the place. Some of it's even fake news. China has built the world's first quantum computer, and it's 24,000 times their competitors. That's not true at all, but you know that's the way the media works. Sometimes there's uh, uh, falsehoods in there. We are very excited to be in the middle of this storm, and, and we as a small Canadian company, we believe are actually the leader worldwide in quantum computing. We're the first company, as, as Barbara mentioned, that has built commercial quantum computers, and we believe we have a significant lead over uh, any of the competition. It's also fun for us to be here uh, with the folks from UBC. We actually were formed at UBC. We weren't quite a, a technically a spin out of UBC, but we've had a long heritage with them and many of our folks have come from there back in 1999. So we've been at this for almost 20 years and I think the, the fruits of that labor are starting to show. The reason why quantum computing gets so much attention I think is fairly simple. Classical computing that we've all enjoyed that has dramatically improved our lives and brought us this amazing power that, that we enjoy every day is running out of gas because of Moore's law. Gordon Moore put together this set of laws, really an observation on how the semiconductor industry grow and the power of computing would grow over time. We're now approaching the end of that, largely because the line widths in these semiconductors are getting so small and the power consumption of these uh, semiconductors that drive our computer center, our, our data centers today are just completely overwhelming our ability to, to use that much power. You see data centers being put next to hydroelectric plants, for instance. So quantum computing has the promise of providing a, a radically different approach. It's not focused on all of the problems in computing, but problems that are very, very complex. Computer scientists know these as NP-hard problems. And if you look at the graph uh, on, on the right-hand side here, classical computing performance, I think, will grow at a, at a modest rate over time. But you're about to see this inflection point in quantum computing where it's going to surpass the capability of classical computing for these, these types of very hard problems. And I'd characterize it as we're kind of very close to that crossover point today. In fact, D-Wave has demonstrated and our customers have demonstrated that we can outperform the best of what classical computing does in what are called synthetic problems or benchmark problems. We're about to show that same advantage in real problems that mean, uh, that, that show real return on investment for customers. Once that happens, quantum being more powerful than classical computing in a domain of applications is going to be one of the most exciting things to happen in the computing industry for a very long time. So let me talk briefly about what a quantum computer is, and Barbara touched upon a little of this. So every quantum computer, uses something called a qubit, a quantum bit. And a quantum bit can be in zero or one, like a digital bit, the building block of classical computers. But it can also be in the superposition of zero and one at the same time. And this is a very hard concept for us to grasp, but it's an object, a bit in this case, that is in two states at the same time. And that is a, a powerful capability that allows us to build these quantum computers that tap into the, the nature uh, that really nature at this fundamental level. The problem with quantum computing and why it's difficult to build is it requires a fairly extreme environment. To protect these chips that we build, you have to have a, a very exotic environment, very, very low temperature, 180 times colder than interstellar space. We have, um, it, this is shielded with, with a dozen of, of shields around it to create this magnetic vacuum. And, and a very low pressure environment. So these environments that our, our system has inside of it are among the rarest, coldest, uh, most pure environments in the universe, unless there's other intelligent life in the universe that we don't know about. So that's why it's been hard to develop these, these, these quantum computers, and you're just starting to see them today. This is our quantum processor. It looks like a chip. It's about the size of your fingernail. Very similar in the way it's built than uh, as all semiconductor chips are, uh, but it's a superconductor. It runs down at these incredibly low temperatures. 
And, and really what this is all about, and the most important part of quantum computing, is it's a capability to solve these very hard problems. And these problems exist in every business and every industry. Uh, and the way we sort of categorize the, the problems is, is broken down here. This, uh, the impact uh, for quantum computing will be in machine learning and something called sampling, which is drawing, drawing samples from a probability distribution. Optimization, optimizing um, uh, routes and, and, and uh, logistics and things like that, and in material science. So in those four categories. The three first categories, machine learning, sampling, and optimization, are applicable to almost any vertical. So let me go through a couple of examples of applications that might help uh, illustrate some of this. So the first one is some work that we did with Volkswagen. Um, and this was done in Germany with a team from Volkswagen Research. And the challenge there was to develop an optimization technology that would allow Volkswagen to optimize the routes for taxi cabs in Beijing. And those of you that have been to Beijing know that this is a problem. So they basically had this public domain data from taxi cabs in Beijing. Uh, and they built together with us an algorithm to run on the quantum computer to basically tell an individual taxi cab driver to take a different route to smooth out all this traffic. So they did this on the D-Wave computer. And the results are, are shown here. This is kind of a heat map of what the traffic typically looks like. And on the right-hand side, you'll see um, a, a flattened out map where the heat map shows that the traffic routes are, are, are much less, or the traffic is much less. Uh, and this was a test of whether this kind of technology could be of use in, in a production setting into the future. So I believe Volkswagen has, has the intent of ha offering this as a service down the road, but this was a successful proof, proof of concept and outperformed the techniques that they, they used to do this kind of uh, optimization typically uh, within Volkswagen. So that's, that's one example. Another example, which is a, a little bit fun, is with a partner of ours called QBranch. Uh, and they used uh, our quantum computer to simulate um, uh, election modeling, to do statistical analysis of an election. And they picked an interesting election that just finished, which was the 2016 presidential election in the States. And you know that most of the models were wrong. Um, in fact, some of them had 99% chance of, of, of Hillary Clinton winning, Hillary winning over Donald Trump. Uh, so the question is, where did these models go wrong? And could you build a model that would outperform the best of, of, of what these experts had built? So this company, QBranch, which is a partner of ours, set about building a machine learning application using our quantum computer to build, to train a model to understand the dynamics of the election uh, results in, in, in the US. And of course, they had the data that they could change, that, that, that they could train these models. So they built this, and the result is they found that uh, they were able to learn structure uh, in, in the polls at least as well as 538. This is Nate Silver's company, which is uh, you know, among the best in this sort of polling analysis. So they built this, uh, th this model. And they, they found that it performed quite well, and it gave uh, Trump a much higher likelihood of, of winning the election overall. Now, of course, the proof is in the pudding on whether this will be useful in future elections, but it was a very promising result, and, and the company QBranch uh, uh, really felt good about uh, their, their model. So those are just two very brief examples. There's hundreds of others that I'd love to talk to you about. Quantum computing is going to change the world. It's not necessarily going to replace all of classical computing, and I think it's really going to be used in conjunction with quantum, quantum computing, so classical computing and quantum computing in a hybrid approach. Most of those resources today, from a classical point of view, are put in the cloud. So the cloud is a very logical place to put quantum computing resources, and our goal is to provide these quantum computing resources to the world through the cloud, just like classical computing resources as well. And what that will bring is, is I believe, better answers and, and faster answers, and more accurate answers, uh, and a better return on investment for companies that eventually wind up using quantum computers. But the exciting thing is, if you think about it, there will be a class of applications that you couldn't address any other way unless you have a quantum computer. Because there are 
uh, computing problems out there that are very significant that are only addressable by quantum computers. And these could be things like uh, modeling climate change into the future or developing better uh, cancer drugs, things like that, things that are very impactful in human scale problems. Down on the bottom, you probably saw some of the applications that we've already worked on uh, and have early results. We call them proto applications that are using this kind of capability. So to finish up, I really like this, this quote from Max Planck. He says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And I think this is really true of quantum computing. It's a completely different tool. We want to put this in the hands of researchers, developers, and business people around the world so that they can take advantage of this computational capability and improve their businesses and find the problem sets that are going to take them to the next level. And again, these are human scale problems that um, I think are, are, are very important. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to the upcoming years when we're able to demonstrate this technology to the world uh, and we continue to make progress in our business and, and uh, find these applications that have a wide scale impact and, and, and big success. And, and as a, a small Canadian company, we're very proud uh, of, of what's been, uh, what we've done. And uh, D-Wave, I believe, is one of the most important technologies in the world. And uh, it's just been a, a real honor of mine to be part of this company and, and um, see the progress that we've made as a company. But we've got a lot more to do and uh, look forward to telling you about that another time. So thank you. Well, I have to say I am uh, absolutely thrilled to be here. Thank you so much to the organizing staff. Thank you, uh, Bill and Wayne, for inviting me to give this presentation. I am the new dean of the Faculty of Applied Science at the University of British Columbia. This is actually only the sixth day in that role, and I'm, I'm absolutely uh, thrilled that this is part of that sixth day. Uh, I have to also say that uh, following a presentation on quantum computing is a pretty tough gig to follow, but I, I thought maybe I would just start this presentation on the future of engineering education and talk a little bit as a segue about the story of Jordy Rose, who, is, uh, who was a PhD student at UBC, who also was the founder of D-Wave, and Jordy for a long time came back and he always taught the first lecture in our technology entrepreneurship course, uh, which he took when he, was a, when he was a PhD physics student. And he came back and he taught that course uh, time and again really to give the message that of all of the courses he took, and of course he took a lot of deep technology courses and a PhD in physics, but this course on technology entrepreneurship was really the most important and most transformative uh, course and event that he had taken in his life. And at that time it was taught by a gentleman named Hag Ferris, and Hag was not only the, the instructor of the course, but also one of the first, um, uh, first investors into D-Wave, and so it's, I think there's a, the lesson there is it's the courses outside of your main discipline that are really maybe the most important part of an educational experience in, uh, in, in terms of creating exceptional people and extraordinary companies. So before I go on with my talk, I, it, I did just want to spend a second to celebrate the uh, alumni UBC's 100th birthday with a little bit of video, and so I will play uh, this video for you. For the last century, from each of the places we called home, our paths converged at UBC. We worked hard, supported each other, and graduated with a sense of accomplishment. We were shaped by the knowledge and experiences we gained and know they contributed to who we've become. As individuals, we are talented and unique. And as one, we're a powerful movement of difference makers. Knowing that we're stronger together, Alumni UBC was formed by UBC's first graduates on May 4th, 1917. Now, 100 years on, we're more than 325,000 strong, spanning over 140 countries. And when we bring our ideas, interests, and energy together, it's a beautiful thing. 
To mark our 100th year, we're building our community around the globe with an ambitious goal, making 100,000 connections. And there are many ways to take part. There's everything from joining one of our social media communities to attending or hosting one of 100 dinners in whatever part of the globe you live. You can also participate in an official Alumni UBC event, either in person or online. And visit the Robert H. Lee Alumni Center on our Vancouver campus, the home of UBC Alumni for Life. The first and easiest way for you to connect is to add yourself to our global alumni map at alumni.ubc.ca. It's quick and simple. So join us in celebrating this remarkable moment in our history by connecting with each other and UBC. And stay tuned for more to come. Happy 100th birthday, Alumni UBC. So I, I love that video. It reminds me of, uh, there's a scene there of uh, the student sitting on the grassy knoll outside of the student <coughs> union building. And so I don't know if, if many of you are UBC alumni, but uh, it does take me back to kind of the early eight or mid 80s, let's say, when I was a student there. So I do invite you to come back to UBC, uh, see our new student union building, see our new alumni center. Please feel free to contact me if you want to learn more about what we're doing in terms of engineering education. I'd appreciate it if you would reach out. So what I want to talk about today is really about, we're going to start with what is the discipline of engineering. And the discipline of engineering is really around integrating a design thinking and uh, you know, the natural and formal sciences. And when I, when, I, when I talk about design thinking, I'm really about, you know, that's, the definition is really the, the creative strategies that designers employ in the development of products and um, processes, and of course science being you know, chemistry, physics, math. And engineering as a discipline is really one of the, is, a, is an old discipline. At UBC it's 100 years old. We were a founding faculty of the university. And if we think back to what engineering uh, looked like maybe you know, 50 years ago, we'd see something that kind of look, or we'd think of something stereotypical that looks like this. And what do we see? We see, you know, white shirts, black ties, pocket protectors, male dominated. You know, this, this era of engineering was really had a strong focus on uh, the science and the mathematics and would have had much less um, focus on design and teamwork and creativity. And if we look at where engineering has gone, you know, we see something, you know, they're still having fun, a little more colorful, a lot more diverse. Um, but what we've really done in terms of the changes in the engineering educational experience is we've really worked over the last two decades to integrate much more design thinking, much more creativity, much more partnership, and not just add courses on projects and add things, but to really fundamentally weave that through the entire educational experience. And you know, we, we've, I think we've done that very well over the last year or the last almost two decades. And in, now it's a time to think of, you know, what's the future of engineering? And if we look to what the future of engineering, one of the things we know is that technology is gonna be increasingly pervasive through every sector, whether that's the healthcare sector, whether that's the uh, advanced manufacturing sector, whether that's a resource extraction, uh, we know that uh, technology is going to continue to be pervasive. In fact, you know, we hear and talk about every job being a tech job in the future. But what we don't really appreciate is that the pace of technological revolution is only accelerating. If we look at where we are right now, you know, we're in the middle of a robotics, additive manufacturing, industry 4.0 revolution that will see you know, the complete automation of manufacturing over the next 10 years or, or two decades. We're also in the midst of an artificial intelligence revolution powered by big data, powered by uh, quantum computers that's gonna change everything from service the service industry, to the retail industry, to the transportation of goods and people. And we're also in the midst of a, of a huge genomics revolution. Technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 are gonna change everything from healthcare and medicine, to aging, 
but even to agriculture and to the production of chemicals and materials. And if you looked at any one of these areas and you said, you know, each one of these areas would be world changing, you know, job destroying, job creating. But when you look at them all together, you realize that right now we're amidst of an unprecedented rate of technological change like no other time in history. And so what, what's that re, what has resulted in is just incredible demand increase in engineering as a discipline. If we look at here, here's the demand for engineering over other disciplines at UBC, but this is true in Canada and across the world. There's a tremendous, uh, tremendous increasingly demand for engineering. And I put it to you, if the future is that every job is going to be a tech job, then the future of engineering really needs to look much more like the liberal arts degree of the 21st century. And, and I guess what I mean by that when I talk about a liberal arts, you know, liberal arts as defined by Wikipedia would really be the um, subjects and skills required by uh, a free person to fully participate in civic life. And so with pervasive technology, you know, the modern engineering degree may be just that discipline to provide that. But we know that if engineering is to become this liberal arts degree of the 21st century, it's going to have to change and it's going to have to grow and it's going to have to transform. But it will still have, I think, at the, dis at the, at the core of its discipline, uh, design thinking and science integrated together, which I've kind of represented by our, our happy students uh, in the center of this circle. And there are the, you know, some of the things that we do need to really focus on are, are I'm going to start with uh, diversity inclusivity. It is amazing to me that it's 2018 and we are still having a discussion on gender parity in engineering, given that it's, in, that it's importance in society. You, engineering, unlike law, unlike medicine, that were all male dominated, you know, decades ago, have, have met gender parity and exceeded gender parity. Whereas engineering, currently we have 13% participation in the profession from women. And if we look at some of the data coming out of the World Economic um, Forum, at the current rate of change, we're gonna see, it's gonna take another 100 years to reach gender parity. And so at UBC, what we've done and we've championed is a, is a whole number of uh, programs aimed at increasing the attraction and retention into, uh, into the university. And we've set a goal of 50-50 by 2020, and I'm, 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 I'm thrilled to say we've made tremendous, um, tremendous progress. You know, if we went back to 2010, we would have had 16% of our first year class being women. In 2015, just five years later, we, we've, we've read, reached 33%. One third of the class is uh, women coming into our program. But I'm also sad to say that we, have, we are, we are, we are going to fail to meet our goal of 50-50 by 2020. In the last couple years, we have been flat at 33%, 32%, 31%. And so what we have done is we've invested in a national network of researchers, a $9 million research project over the next six years to identify and develop strategies to remove the barriers for women not only being attracted into the um, university system, but being retained through the university system across the STEM uh, disciplines, but also being attracted and retained into uh, the profession. We've also made investments in what is a fabulous outreach program to K-12 to because we know that that's important and we call that program Gearing Up and it provides summer camps, it provides teacher education, it provides in-classroom activities and last year we had 17,000 uh, K-12 to students engaged in that program in 43 communities. 2,000 of those students were Indigenous students. It's a fantastic program. We would love to see that uh, go national. And we've made uh, tremendous progress inside our own house. We, I'm proud to say that over the last three years, we've had 40% of our uh, new assistant professors coming in who are women, who are uh, going to 
be the role models of, and uh, the mentors for the next gen generation of women coming into, uh, the prof uh, into the university and onto the profession. So in, a in addition to gender equality, we also know that engineering needs to include more business, more management, more leadership skills. And one of the first projects we've, we, or the project we did a couple years back is we developed a, a one-year course-based Masters of Engineering Leadership in partnership with our good friends at the uh, Sauter um, School of Business that brings uh, deep technological pillars across nine different uh, dis disciplines in important areas to society like clean energy, like software design, um, like advanced manufacturing, and brings that with a platform of business management and leadership uh, uh, skills. We also know that we need to really include more policy, more community engagement, more decision, uh, more decision making skills into that program. And we're working with our uh, policy school, with our School of Community and Regional Planning to integrate that and that's under development. I'd be happy to talk about that uh, uh, as we build out that programming. We also recognize that cultural fluency amongst our students is increasingly important. All markets, all companies, uh, colleagues are increasingly uh, highly internationalized and so we've created a new program that we call the Coordinated International Exchange which allows every student in third year to seamlessly take a, uh, a term abroad in any one of our 17 partner uh, universities and, and we're growing those in three different continents across Europe, Asia and Australia. We're also working on an increased experiential learning platform. So going beyond the traditional engineering co-op to provide opportunities for our students to have a entrepreneurial experience during their summer terms or perhaps be involved in an infrastructure project um, with an NGO in Africa or, or doing a community engagement project with a nonprofit association, you know, in their own community. And we're building and we're also bringing more innovation and more entrepreneurship right into the curriculum. And it's important to understand that innovate, you know, whether you're going to go off and create a new company or if you're just going to bring that spirit of innovation into a larger organization. And so UBC has created a whole host of support mechanisms for innovation and venture creation, which include things like Hatch, our new uh, technology incubator, but as well as our entrepreneurship program has things like a Lean Launchpad, a Venture Builder, a host of entrepreneurs and residents. We've created a philanthropic seed fund to make early investments into our communities. We've created a, a partnership with the University of Toronto to bring the Creative Destruction Lab, Destruction Lab uh, to the West Coast. Uh, which provides a uh, stage gate process for securing venture capital for some of these very early stage venture, uh, uh, from these early stage companies. And we've also just this year started a entrepreneurship minor for, uh, again in partnership with our friends in the Sauter School of Business, uh, to, uh, to, uh, available to all engineering students. And we're also looking at gateway programs because we know in the future that uh, your doctor is going to start life as an engineer, your teacher is going to start life as an engineer, your p lawyer, your politician will all start life as, an in as engineers with the liberal arts of the 21st century. So things like our School of Biomedical Engineering provide an opportunity for the students who go through this engineering degree are... Um, are, are prepared and meet all of the prerequisites for every Canadian medical school across Canada. And again, that's in partnership with our Faculty of Medicine. And so if we look now at engineering as the liberal arts degree of the 21st century, we really see, again, at the core, uh, a design and science as the core discipline, but really with all of these other attributes that are really aimed at future-proofing you know, the current generation of students and the next generation of students against a rapidly evolving uh, technology landscape. 
And we're, we're also working to export this core discipline. And so to export engineering skills across other disciplines of commerce, law, medicine, education, and working on new delivery methods to get those fundamental skills into those other, um, other disciplines. So I think I'd, I'd like to just leave you with one thought, and that thought is that uh, engineering is evolving into the liberal arts degree of the 21st century. It's really aimed at future-proofing you know, this generation of students and the next generation of students against uh, uh, you know, a backdrop of unprecedented technological change. And uh, I'd just like to thank you for your attention, and I'll leave it at that. You know, when I spoke earlier about what a wonderful director Bill White has been to the Empire Club of Canada, I wasn't saying those words lightly. He uh, put together for us uh, last year, uh, for Canada's 150th birthday, um, a, 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 series, a sesquicentennial series of events. This is the 10th and the last in those events. And I would like to ask our, our series sponsor, and represented by Mike White, um, from IBK Capital, as well as our two guests of honor to join me below and blow out the birthday candles uh, in this final, this final sesquicentennial event. You are. <laughs> Now my great pleasure to welcome Mike Bill White to uh, thank our esteemed speakers. Madam President, distinguished head table guests, fellow members and guests of the Empire Club of Canada, I have the pleasure to express our formal thanks to our two key speakers. Vern, as Chief Executive Officer of D-Wave, we believe your company is the most important technology company in the world. The digital world is changing rapidly. With significant change comes great opportunity. D-Wave is positioned to benefit from a huge untapped market immediately ahead. With the leadership of Vern and his team, we expect D-Wave to enjoy significant growth in revenue and accelerated growth at scale. Now, 50 years ago, my wife and I, Gail, my brother Wayne and his wife, Barb, we graduated from UBC in engineering. So last year, we celebrated 50th alumni in terms of our schooling. And we are absolutely delighted 
that Dean James Olson is in charge now of the Faculty of Applied Science at the University of British Columbia. We got to know James due to his initiatives in transforming engineering education with the entrepreneurship programs. James has successfully managed significant change over the last few years in working with applied science students, faculty members, and alumni. He has also reached out recently to companies in the U.S. like Tesla and in China, Huawei, and m many other major corporations in China. Today we see how forging partnerships with institutions, companies, communities, and individuals, especially involving high-tech and quantum computers, is transforming the future and uh, of computer systems and software, as well as the future of education and engineering especially. We are proud of the role that D-Wave Systems is playing now in the global development of quantum computers. And I'd ask that each of you now join me in a special thank you to Vern and James. Well, without wonderful sponsors like IBK Capital, these lunches that the Empire Club holds would simply not be possible. So once again, I want to express a sincere thank you to IBK, uh, as well as to our presenting sponsor, Poet Technologies. Gold sponsors, Urbana Corporation, Pete Resources Limited, Cobalt Blockchain Project, and UBC. Without sponsors like these, we simply wouldn't be here, and we're so grateful to all of you. I'd also like to thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space for webcasting today's event for thousands of viewers around the world. Also, thank you to the National Post as our print sponsor. Although our club has been around since 1903, we have moved into the 21st century and we are active on social media. Please follow us on Twitter at Empire underscore club and visit us online at www.empireclub.com. Dot org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and on LinkedIn. Finally, please join us again at our next event tomorrow, March the 7th, featuring our Women's Leadership Panel at One King West Hotel. Thank you so much for your attendance today, and this meeting is now adjourned.